Greetings and a very warm welcome to all you precious saints out there on the internet and I hope you do know just how very precious you are. This is episode 6 of our series on invisible war, the battle going on in the unseen realm of the spirit that's happening all around us all the time and which we need to be very aware of. We've been going through the five A's of spiritual warfare and we are now currently doing the armour, the armour of God. So in our last video, we looked at the two foundational pieces of armour that a believer in Christ must put on to stay protected from the devil's schemes and attacks in their daily walk. The belt of truth goes on first to ground and anchor us. A Roman legionnaire couldn't strap on his breastplate without first putting on the belt. So it is with spiritual armour. If you're not wearing the belt of truth, you won't be able to wear the breastplate of righteousness. Christ is the truth, so we will only have his righteousness imputed to us if we are encircled by him, anchored in him, abiding in him. To be in Christ and to stay in Christ is our place of greatest safety, the place from which we engage in the spiritual battle. So our text for this whole series is Ephesians 6 and I'm just going to read it again because it's good to really get it into our heads. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith which which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints so we've already looked at awareness and alertness in the five A's and in the armour. As I've said, we've looked at the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. And today we're going to focus on the, the shoes or the sandals, depending on your translation, that must be on our feet. It's really important to wear these sandals. So just as we saw, there was an illusion to the belt and breastplate as part of the Hebrew concept of spiritual armour in the Old Testament. So it is with the sandals or the, the feet shod with the gospel of peace. I'm going to read the whole passage from Isaiah 52 because it does put it all in context. The Lord's coming salvation is what we need to think about in terms of this armour. Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion, put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for there shall be no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake yourself from the dust and arise, be seated, O Jerusalem, loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, you were sold for nothing and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord, my people went down at the first into Egypt to sojourn there and the Assyrian oppressed them for nothing. 
Now therefore, what I have done here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing, their rulers wail, declares the Lord, and continually all day my name is despised. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. So here we can see the Lord is talking about his people and his city, Jerusalem, which has been in captivity, literal physical captivity and spiritual captivity under the boot of the Assyrian, which may be an allusion to the Antichrist, as some Bible scholars believe. And certainly there is a prophetic end time significance because when the Lord refers to that day, it is often a reference to the day of the Lord, the day of his wrath, the great and terrible day of the Lord as it's called. But he continues, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns, the voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice together, they sing for joy, for eye to eye, they see the return of the Lord to Zion. So it's these feet which bring good news and the published peace on the mountains, bringing news of happiness. This is what Paul is referring to in Ephesians 6. But there is much more because in Isaiah 52, it goes on to say, break forth into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. He has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And it goes on uh, in verse 12 to say this, for you shall not go out in haste and you shall not go in flight for the Lord will go before you and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. He was pierced for our transgressions Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up. Now, this is definitely prophetic for the time of Jesus's return, when Jerusalem will finally be redeemed. But it's also talking about his first coming, when he was high and lifted up. He was lifted up on the cross for all to see. So, who is it whose feet are beautiful upon the mountains that Isaiah is talking about? Well, firstly, it is Jesus himself. He brought the good news of salvation to his own people. And then he was pierced for our transgressions in order to make peace between God and fallen humanity through the cross for all who would believe on him. Salvation in Hebrew is Yeshua, God saves. Israel rejected him at his first coming, so they have been temporarily set aside whilst the gospel goes out to the Gentile nations to bring them into the commonwealth of Israel. And in this passage, we see that the Lord will return as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to rescue his Jewish people from the armies of the Antichrist. Then his saving grace goes forth not only to Zion, to Jerusalem, but to the very ends of the earth. And he goes on in Isaiah 52 verse 14 to say this, as many as were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So he shall sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. 
So the sprinkling of many nations is referring to the blood of Christ. The impact of this prophecy is profound, reminding us of Isaiah 53, the suffering servant whose appearance was so marred that he was barely recognisable as human. And then in Revelation we have a picture of the lamb looking like it had been slain and that Greek word for slain uh, is svatso, referring to an animal that has been freshly butchered, freshly slaughtered for sacrifice. We often overlook the physical suffering that Jesus went through, beaten black and blue, and struck repeatedly on the face even before he was sent to be scourged. Let's stop for a minute and think about that scourging. The Romans used something called a flagellum or a flagrum, uh, which was a many-stranded leather whip with sharp bits of glass and metal knotted into it that would rip and tear the flesh down to the bone and usually cause such a degree of agony and blood loss that the victim, more often than not, did not survive. It would literally tear their flesh to ribbons. And I think about Jesus standing before Pilate after his scourging, with a crown of thorns on his head and how his flesh had already been torn apart and the incredible anguish and agony that he must have been in. The fact that Jesus survived all of that being before, before being made to carry his own cross piece to the place of crucifixion, to have his wrists and ankles pierced through with massive iron nails that would have crushed bone and nerves and then to struggle for hours to raise himself up enough to gasp a breath of air. It was a slow death by suffocation, and it's truly astonishing that he went through this for us. His passion was a crucible of extreme physical agony, endured with the unbearable spiritual pain of having the weight of humanity's sin laid on him, and the full cup of God's wrath against the sin of men poured out upon him in full measure. This is the truth of the gospel of peace, and it has indeed shut the mouths of many kings. We can think of kings down through history who have bent the knee and bowed the head before Christ as their saviour and acknowledged him. I think first of all, predominantly of our own King Alfred in Britain, who was a wonderful Christian king who finally united the um, the, the Anglo-Saxon world and, and was the first to establish the law, the Judeo-Christian principles of our, our law courts, which has sadly been eroded now, but it was Alfred who first did that. And he was one who had the humility to bow the knee and to cast his crown before the real High King of Heaven, who would give his perfect sinless life for our salvation. Jesus was a herald of the gospel of peace and the coming kingdom of God. But not only was he the herald, he also himself was that gospel. So what is the gospel of peace? in the context of spiritual warfare and why am I mentioning it here? We usually understand peace to mean the absence of conflict but in Hebrew the word shalom means so much more. It comes from the, the root word shalom. In Exodus 21 and 22 Moses gives instructions to the people about what to do when someone suffers material loss or in case of theft or loss of property. When a loss or an injury occurs, the owner is considered lacking or not complete. He's had something taken from him. The one responsible for the injury or theft has to make it right. So this word shalom is translated as to make good 
to make full restitution, to restore. It carries the sense of making something whole again with an overall sense of fullness in mind, body and estate. The true biblical concept of peace therefore means an inward sense of completeness, wholeness and inner tranquility. To say shalom to someone is to give them a blessing in Hebrew. If we're wearing the shoes or sandals of the gospel of shalom, then we're walking in the reality of wholeness and completeness that we have in Christ. And that means wherever we go in the world, we're witnessing to the truth that God the Father has accepted the sacrifice of his only begotten Son as the final payment for all the sin of humanity. And he's opened up a wonderful way for men and women to be restored to spiritual completeness through the cross and to find peace with their creator. This is an important mission for us, so let us never forget that this peace of reconciliation with the Lord was won at the very highest price of all, the blood of the sinless Son of God. This is very profound. The blood of Christ not only cleanses us from all sin, but it is the most powerful substance in the universe because it shows every creature in the invisible and visible realms that the victory has been won. Satan and his mafia crew cannot stand to see or be reminded of the blood of Christ, so at the sight of it they flee. When we plead the blood of Jesus in our prayers, in our praise or in our proclamations, we are reminding not only humanity but the fallen realm that everything, literally everything, has been done to secure salvation, restoration and resurrection for the saints. Jesus' last words on the cross were, it is finished. He has done all that is necessary to make peace between man and God. Christ is our King of Peace, who had extreme violence done to him by both fallen humanity and the fallen demonic realm, in order to win for mankind everlasting peace with one another and with God. He will bring in his kingdom fully at his return, but in the meantime, he's handed the baton to us. We are now the heralds of peace, proclaiming the salvation through Christ alone, and we are ambassadors for his everlasting kingdom. So our mission is to take this message of possible wholeness, joy and healing that a person can find in Christ and showcase it to the world and to tell people that if they will bow the knee and come in repentance and in faith, they can totally experience this newness of life and this wholeness through Jesus Christ. So back now to our pieces of Roman armour that Paul used for his illustrations of spiritual warfare. The Latin name for a Roman legionnaire's sandals is Caligae, and these sandals had thick leather soles embedded with two sizes of metal studs or hobnails, providing increased traction for walking, running and standing. They were tied onto the feet with numerous leather straps right up to the knee to provide protection for the shins. The open air lightweight design allowed a legionnaire to march up to 50 miles a day carrying up to a hundred pounds of weaponry and provisions. They were the Roman equivalent of modern day military combat boots that provided total stability when holding the line or wrestling in hand to hand combat. And that ability to stand firm is so important. Notice how many times the words stand firm and resist occur in 
the New Testament, especially in Ephesians chapter 6, when talking about the spiritual struggle that we're engaged in, we are expected to hold our ground. The message is clear that we must wear these sandals of peace to be properly equipped to share the gospel of peace and the love of Christ with all men and women. We must be in right standing and at peace with God ourselves and then filled to overflowing with his peace that, that bypasses all human intellect and understanding. We cannot achieve this peace by our own efforts. It's a gift of God. We are commanded to try and live at peace with all men because men and women, as we have said in this series continually, men and women are not the enemy. The real enemy are the satanic powers of the fallen realm, manipulating people through false belief systems, false ideologies, false doctrines of demons, and stirring up destructive emotions in the human heart, like hatred, envy, greed, revenge, suspicion, violence, and lies. The demonic realm will always encourage mankind to meet violence with violence, rage with rage and spite with spite, because it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And into the centre of this fallen world full of violence, we are to bring the peace of God. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6.15, that our feet must be fitted with the readiness to bring the gospel of peace. We must have an obedient willingness to respond to the Lord's prompting to share the true meaning of the gospel. So a really critical part of our spiritual warfare is actually evangelism. In fact, we could go so far as to say that if we're not preaching the gospel or witnessing to the truth, in some way or another, then we're not really engaging in spiritual warfare. You might say that you're not gifted to speak or preach to people, that you're not a natural evangelist and not quick-witted enough to engage in debate and contend for the faith. But, you know, that's okay because we all have different roles and we all do have a testimony about the impact that the gospel has made on our lives. We can all do simple things like to give someone a Bible or a tract or a bookmark or even show them a verse in the Bible. You might be sitting on a plane, on a train, you might be in a doctor's waiting room waiting for some kind of an appointment or another or you might be a place where there there's an opportunity just to leave some literature around because you just never know who might be there and pick one up because they have a need in their heart and moreover we need to remember that the word of god is living and powerful and active it can do its work even without us having to say a word. I believe this is especially a good way to evangelise in our prosperous Western civilization. so we must persevere. Some of us will sow the seeds, others of us will pour a bit of water on the shoot, so we can see that spiritual warfare is not all about binding demons and rebuking Satan. That is certainly necessary in some instances, of course, but a big part of our struggle is the mission of wearing those sandals of peace in order to fulfil the Great Commission to go into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Understandably, we might feel nervous about doing this for fear of a hostile reception and the reception to the gospel is becoming increasingly hostile in society around us. Sharing the gospel, though, is always going to stir things up because it's 
an offence and an outrage to the proud and the intellectually arrogant, to those set on pursuing their own carnal pleasures. But if we are filled with the peace of God, we cannot be dismayed or surprised by any such reaction. Besides, we have the Holy Spirit within us to empower us and guide us, as John says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Satan's spirit of Antichrist that rules this world is no match for the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is omniscient, omnipresent and omnipotent, whereas Satan can only be in one place at one time, so he has to rely on his minions. But we can use the authority of the name of Jesus Christ to silence the demons. So do not fear the fallen realm is the message, the very important message to get across. Do not fear the fallen realm is already doomed and they know it. And there will always be those in the midst of those who are offended by the gospel and shake a fist at us. There will always be those who are searching for the truth. Those who do want to hear what the Spirit of God is saying, who are desperate to find the way to peace. It's amazing as we see the fastest growing ministries today, or one of them is in the prison ministries. Our prisons are full of desperate men and women who have lived with their torment and chaos for years and who crave peace in their hearts. They are quick to recognise more often what is the real deal. They are hungry and thirsty for spiritual food and living water. Using peace to fight war is an amazing and a very powerful concept. If someone is full of anger towards you, we are called not to stoop down to fight our human enemies on their level, as this will ruin our witness for the gospel of peace. So do not meet anger, hostility and outrage or offence with the same, because those are satanic weapons. And the devil, as we know, is forever plotting and scheming to get us to go on the defensive, to rise to the bait, to allow ourselves to be provoked into anger, especially at what we might perceive as an unjust act or accusation against us. Jesus himself commands us not to retaliate or be resentful, but to show an angry person the love of Christ through peace. He told us to pray for our enemies. We can rise above petty human disputes and squabbles because we've nothing to prove. We know already that we're all sinners who fall short of the glory of God and that we all need his grace and mercy. If your adversary is blind to the truth, he will be furiously fighting his own corner in his own strength. Whereas we, as believers, who can stand firm on the word of God, planted in truth and being in right standing with him, need have no fear of the accuser. What can man do to us? So our text also for kingdom living in fact it's like a manual for kingdom living are the beatitudes which which jesus told us plainly in simple language it's like a, a kingdom living 101 some pastors call it and jesus says this as he opened his mouth and taught them saying blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
So all of these qualities that are blessed by the Lord are part of this gospel of peace and they are the hallmarks of those who are who have been adopted back into the Lord's family as sons and daughters of the living God. Not only does Jesus teach us the attitude we should have to others, but he also lays out some very radical ideas that go completely against the grain of normal human behaviour. I should say normal human behaviour in the flesh. Blessed are you when others revile you, he says, and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is a radical thing. So in a sense, we know that if people react with hostility and offence to the gospel message, then we have hit home, we've hit a sore spot and they are being really stirred up. So we are doing the right thing, in other words. And then he goes on to say, I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, to the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, and from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either, give to everyone who begs from you, and from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. As you wish that others would do to you, do you so unto them. This is from both the Gospel of Matthew and of Luke, verses 27 to 28. So this is the way it works in what some have called the upside down kingdom. In the kingdom of God, things really are turned on their head. The first will be last and the last first. The guilty one who deserves judgment will receive mercy if they are penitent. The one who rages in hate will be met with love and forgiveness if they confess. This is the gospel of peace we can preach because through the blood of Christ, mankind has been reconciled already. If you love those, Jesus goes on in Luke 32 to 36 if you love those who love you what benefit is that to you for even sinners love those who love them and if you do good to those who do good to you what benefit is that to you for even sinners do the same and if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive what credit is that to you even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Jesus here was reiterating the values and principles that he himself had established as they were all in the Old Testament anyway. For example, in Proverbs 25 verses 21 to 22, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink, for you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will re reward you. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes his enemies to be at peace with him. Proverbs 16, 7. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Proverbs 24, 17. We sometimes forget that all of the gospel principles that Jesus taught were already embedded in the Old Testament. This teaching of Christ is echoed also by the apostles in their epistles. So, as Paul writes to Timothy, First of all, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people, 
for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Saviour, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, and which is the testimony given at the proper time. We can see then this radical principle of offering the gospel of peace first to human beings who are not the enemy. The enemy is the demonic powers on the back that manipulate human beings rather like puppet masters but we must see we must see to the heart of the person and offer them peace and um, he goes on in Romans Paul says this let love be genuine the marks of a true Christian abhor what is evil hold fast to what is good love one another with brotherly affection outdo one another in showing honour do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honourable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And then Paul echoes um, those words from Proverbs 25. He says to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. And then, most important of all, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. We are called to live as overcomers. Paying back evil with good is a revolutionary concept in spiritual warfare. Because unbelievers are primed to retaliate and match anger with anger, spite with spite, and offence with offence, aggression with aggression, as we have already seen. But we believers are called to pull out the rug from under an angry person's feet and to flip things in a totally unexpected way that can completely disarm them. And again, it's part of the upside down kingdom that is counterintuitive and countercurrent because just as Jesus said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is a place of light, truth, beauty, peace, harmony and real love, real deep affection and agape self-sacrificing love that puts the needs of another person before our own. These are the qualities and values that we must take out into the world with a readiness to spread the word that the shed blood of Christ and the resurrection has made a way for every individual to be reconciled to God. So we can see from this that spreading the gospel of peace is as much our spiritual warfare as telling demons to go in the name of Jesus or taking authority over a situation in his name. We may have the rest of the armour on, but without the correct footwear, the combat boots of the gospel of salvation, the gospel of shalom, we won't get very far. As Paul says in Romans 10 verse 15, 
And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them who preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. We need feet that are obedient to go wherever the Lord wants to send them. Satan knows his time is getting very short, so he's scheming double time to block the sending out of the gospel to the ends of the earth. We need to have those beautiful feet in combat boots to take it wherever the Lord wants it to go. And it may not be very far, so don't panic and think that you have to travel vast distances. In fact, our mission field is usually right on our very doorstep if we pray for those opportunities that the Lord will put people across our path who need to hear. So I've taken a lot of time over the first three pieces of the armour, the belt, the breastplate and the shoes, because I believe they are so important to understand properly. And next time I'm going to look at the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation.